Welcome to Pictures from Pilgrim's Progress by Charles Spurgeon. Uh, we're starting at the beginning of this work for this reading. This Reformation MP3 audio resource is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books, many free Puritan and Reformed resources, as well as our complete online catalog containing classic and contemporary Reformation books, digital downloads, MP3s, videos, DVDs, CDs, and the Puritan hard drive at great discounts or on the web at puritandownloads.com. Also, please consider, pray, and act upon the important truths found in the following quotation by also Charles Spurgeon. As the Apostle says to Timothy, so also he says to everyone, Give yourself to reading. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. You need to read. Renounce as much as you will all light literature, but study as much as possible sound theological works, especially the Puritanic writers and expositions of the Bible. The best way for you to spend your leisure is to be either reading or praying. If you'd like to be added to our email list, please send an email to swrb at swrb.com with the word add, A-D-D, in the subject line. Our email list is a double opt-in list, so once you've sent us your email address, you'll be asked by email to confirm that you want to join our list using the email address you've supplied. Your email information will be kept confidential, and you can easily remove yourself from our email list by simply emailing us at swrb at swrb.com with the word remove in the subject line. Once you're on our email list, you'll be alerted to all the new free Reformation resources, free MP3s, free electronic books and text, etc. SWRB makes available on the web as well as at times to our best discounts and super specials. We also encourage you to reproduce this audio resource and to pass it on to your friends. But we only authorize this as long as the full contents of the message, including the header and trailer, is not altered in any way, and as long as the audio file is given away for free. And now to SWRB's reading of Pictures from Pilgrim's Progress by Charles Spurgeon, which we hope you find to be a great blessing, and which we pray draws you nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. Pictures from Pilgrim's Progress, Charles Spurgeon, a commentary on portions of John Bunyan's immortal allegory with prefatory note by Thomas Spurgeon. Now for that prefatory note. <clears throat> when it was first reported to me that a series of addresses on the Pilgrim's Progress had been discovered, I rejoiced as one that findeth great spoil. For I hope that after enriching the pages of the sword and the trowel, these fragrant flowers might be gathered together into a delightful nosegay. In the mercy of God, my hopes have been fulfilled. Month by month, the pictures have appeared for nearly a year and a half in the magazine. An abundant testimony is to hand, to hand that they have proved welcome to its readers. And now the full time has come for the issue of the book, and here it is. A sparkling circlet, now that the gems are strung together. Three additional pictures will be found herein, to wit, Christian at the Cross, Christian and Apollyon, and Vanity Fair. It's not a little surprising that no trace could be found of any reference in the course of lectures to these outstanding features of the story. It does not follow, however, that the great preacher passed them by. Possibly they were not reported, or the manuscripts may have gone astray. A little search in C. H. Spurgeon's sermons and other works secured <clears throat> excuse me, sufficient and I venture to think appropriate material for the missing sketches. So in love with John Bunyan and so akin to him in faith and thought and language was the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle that I am persuaded another volume could be compiled comprising pictures of other striking scenes and characters in the glorious allegory. Who can doubt that abundant material could be found in the Spurgeon Library for pictures of 
Christian under Mount Sinai, or Hail Difficulty, Doubting Castle, Little Faith, Beulah Land, and Valiant for Truth, for instance. There's internal evidence that these addresses were delivered at Monday evening prayer meetings with a special purpose of edifying such as had just begun to go on pilgrimage. You young converts, said the preacher again and again in his personal and incisive style. Nevertheless, the more advanced in his congregation, I am certain, were eager and delighted listeners too. So will it be with this book. Here is milk for babes and meat for men. Moreover, the meat is such that the babes will enjoy a taste of it, and the men will be all the better for a sip or two of the milk. C. H. Spurgeon was a past master in the art of commenting. Who that ever heard him did not rejoice as much in his exposition of the scriptures as in his prayers and sermons. He has commented in print on the Psalms, the treasure of David, on Matthew, the gospel of the kingdom, and on Manton, illustrations and mediations, or flowers from a Puritan's garden. Here we have his commentary on the Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, as he himself describes it. It's easy to see that the commentator is in sympathy with his author and that he loves his task. If Mr. Spurgeon were ever prevailed upon to fill up a page of the once popular confession album, I'm pretty sure that his answer to the query, who is your favorite author, was John Bunyan. He has spoken of him over and over again as my great favorite, and has left it on record that he had read The Pilgrim's Progress at least 100 times. The reason for his liking is not far to seek. They both loved the Book of Books. Urging the earnest study of the scriptures, C. H. Spurgeon once said, Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the word of the Lord, not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our inmost parts. It is idle merely to let the eye glance over the words or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historical facts, but it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scripture models. And what's better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his. You will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He has read it till his very soul was saturated with Scripture, and though his writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, without continually making us feel and say, Why, this man's a living Bible. <laughs> Prick him anywhere. His blood is bibline, the very essence of of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his very soul is full of the word of God. I commend his example to you, beloved. Moreover, the language of the illustrious dreamer was to the mind of the tabernacle pastor. They spake the same tongue. In an address delivered in 1862 on the occasion of the restoration of Bunyan's tomb, Mr. Spurgeon assured his hearers that Bunyan's works would not try their constitutions as might those of Gill and Owen. They are pleasant reading, said he, for Bunyan wrote and spoke in simple Saxon and was a diligent reader of the Bible in the old version. It was doubtless my dear father's intention to publish these addresses, for he had commenced the revision of them. Would that he had been able to accomplish the task. They would have been much more perfect then. As it is, we have them very much as he uttered them. There's no mistaking his voice in these sententious sentences. I fancy that if he had been spared to issue these homilies and to write an introduction, he would have urged his readers, as he did his hearers on the occasion referred to above, to raise a monument to John Bunyan in their hearts, to become his descendants by imbibing the truth that he taught, and to keep his memory green by living in his faith. May the perusal of these pages create a love for the book which they explain and apply as, as well as for the book with which both the writers were saturated. Thomas Spurgeon, Clapham, 1903. We begin then 
with chapter 1, where Pliable sets out with Christian. Now, this is not the Pilgrim's Progress, but simply pictures from that by Charles Spurgeon. <clears throat> Pliable sets out with Christian. Next to the Bible, the book that I value most is John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I believe I've read it through at least a hundred times. It's a volume of which I never seem to tire. And the secret of its freshness is that it is so largely compiled from the scriptures. It is really biblical teaching put into the form of a simple yet very striking allegory. It has been upon my mind to give a series of addresses upon the pilgrim's progress, for the characters described by John Bunyan have their living representatives today. His words have a message for many who are found in our congregation at the present time. You remember that when Christian, with a book in his hand and a great burden upon his back, cried out, What shall I do to be saved? He saw a man named Evangelist coming to him, who pointed him to the wicket gate and the shining light. Then Bunyan says, quote, So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Now he had not run far from his own door, but his wife and children, perceiving it, began to cry after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran on, crying, Life! Life! Eternal life! So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. The neighbors also came out to see him run, and as he ran, some mocked, others threatened, some cried after him to return. Now, among those that did so, there were two that were resolved to fetch him back by force. The name of the one was Obstinate, and the name of the other, Pliable." End of quote. Well, instead of yielding to them, Christian began at once to plead with them to go along with him. Obstinate met all his pleas with mockery and abuse, but Pliable was easily persuaded to go. He's a type of those who apparently set out for heaven, but who have not the root of the matter in them, and therefore soon turn back. The likeness that Bunyan has drawn of him is worthy of our attentive consideration, for it is true in every line. It is significant that in the first instance, Pliable went with obstinate upon the evil errand of endeavoring to bring Christian back to the city of destruction. In like manner, some of those who have been in the habit of keeping the worst of company may sometimes, even without the operation upon them of the grace of God, be induced to forsake their evil companions and to cast in their lot for a season with the followers of Christ. These pliable people who are still a very numerous family, are very dependent upon those by whom they are surrounded. If they happen to have been born in a godly household, it's probable that they will make a profession of religion. It's even possible that they will be highly esteemed, and perhaps for years will bear a most reputable Christian character. If, on the other hand, they happen to be thrown among bad companions, they'll be very easily allured by them and be made to drink to swear, and to fall into all the vices of the stronger persons by whom they are influenced. They scarcely seem to be men. They are mere jellyfish, swept along by every turn of the tide. They lack the true element of manhood, which is firmness. This, by the way, obstinate had in excess. If you could put an obstinate and a pliable together and make them one, you might, speaking of the natural man, have something more nearly approaching true manliness than either of them would be separately. Obstinate had all the firmness, while Pliable had none of it. I think Pliable was a moldable sort of creature, and hence Obstinate did with him as he liked until the poor, feeble fellow came into the grasp of a stronger man than Obstinate, namely Christian. After all, there is no man who is a match for a Christian in the matter of influence. There is a force about the truth which is committed to our charge when it is brought into fair play that is not equaled by any form of lies. If a man's mind is really pliable, there is no doubt that an earnest Christian who has been led by divine grace to walk in the right road will have wonderful control over such a person. So strong was Christian's influence that even while obstinate was reviling, Pliable rebuked him and said, My heart inclines to go with my neighbor. 
Christian had not said very much, he had not appeared to exercise much influence, but something had already told on Pliable. In the very presence and look of a Christian, there is a power over the heart of man. Moreover, influence grows. So it came to pass that Pliable presently went even further and boldly declared, I intend to go along with this good man and to cast in my lot with him. You perceive, however, that Pliable had no burden on his back, as Christian had. This was one of the proofs that he was not a true pilgrim. That which brings men to Christ is a sense of their need of him. Albeit the sense of sin is not a qualification for salvation, yet it is the only motive that ever leads men to trust in Jesus. It is the impetus which divine grace uses when it is drawing or driving men to the Savior. Pliable did not, at first, appear to be greatly troubled when he heard that the city of destruction was doomed. But when Christian talked so prettily about heaven, he thought there might be something in it. Indeed, he felt that there must be when a man like Christian could leave his family and his business to go on a long pilgrimage. So he judged that probably he might do better himself if he went with Christian. But all the while, there was no burden on his back. He had no sense of his need of a savior, and this was a very serious defect to begin with in one who was professing to go on pilgrimage to the celestial city. You will observe, too, that the only thing which tempted Pliable to go was Christian's talk about the inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away. There are some preachers who can descant so prettily upon heaven and the blessed associations of that happy country where they meet to part no more that half their hearers are constrained to say, we also will set out. These divines talk of the wall of jasper, the gates of pearl, the streets of gold, the sea of glass, and the emerald rainbow round about the throne in such a way that persons of a poetical temperament, especially those of a pliable disposition, have their emotions excited by the descriptions which give only a material view of what was intended to be understood in a spiritual sense. They really think that heaven is literally what the book of the Revelation says it is figuratively. They never get at the kernel of the inward sense. It's the husk of the outward meaning that attracts them. They're satisfied, charmed, bewitched, fascinated by that. So they resolve to set out on the journey. Now, to tell the whole truth about Mr. Pliable, I must say that he began exceedingly well. I've already reminded you that he defended Christian when obstinate reviled him. And when obstinate turned his abuse upon Pliable and said, What? More fools still? He did not seem to wince under it. Some of these pliable people will even bear a great deal of persecution and be content to be ridiculed and laughed at. They'll even suffer loss rather than turn back. If they do this really for Christ's sake, it is well, but often it is only born with a view to self-aggrandizement and in order to obtain something better by way of recompense, so that it is selfishness still that rules them. They give up a little of the good that there is in this world, and it is not very much after all that they sacrifice for the sake of the better world that is yet to be revealed. They will not give up all that they have, house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or, or lands for Christ's sake and the gospels. Therefore, they are not Christ's true disciples. They are prepared to make some small sacrifice, but only for the sake of winning heaven or of escaping hell. Observe the way in which Christian treated Pliable after obstinate left them. I dare say he had known him before and understood quite well what a soft, easy-going fellow he was and how very readily he might be twisted either one way or another. Yet he did not disdain his company but said to him, Come, neighbor Pliable, I am glad you are persuaded to go along with me. You and I, dear friends, are bound to invite men to come to Christ, no matter who or what they may be. And we should try to encourage them all we can, even though we may have in our own heart a well-grounded fear that some of them will not hold out to the end. I do not think it is for us to say to young persons who seem to be in earnest about spiritual matters that we are afraid they will not persevere and 
and so discourage them. Our business is rather to say to each one of them, Come, neighbor, come with me, and you shall fare as I do. It is the work of the Spirit to fill the gospel net. It's our duty to throw it and drag it along the bottom. And wherever, whether we catch good fish or bad, it's not so much our concern as our masters. Christian, though not yet at peace himself, had a commendable love for others. It is a beautiful trait, which I like to see in those who feel the secondary work of grace in their souls that they want others to feel as they feel. This conduct on the part of Christian ought to be a lesson to some of you who have long had joy and peace in believing, but who not, do not say to others, Come, neighbor pliable. Seek to have in yourself something of the zeal and compassion of this poor pilgrim with a troubled conscience, yet with a sympathetic heart. And so pliable, without counting the cost or reckoning for a moment upon all the difficulties of the way, set out in a thoughtless, light-hearted manner upon that journey which will always prove too long for those who start on it in their own strength alone. As they went over the plain, Christian began to talk to pliable of what he himself had felt, the powers and terrors of what is unseen. But directly he did so. Um, pliable changed the subject. He did not want to know anything about such matters. He had, in fact, taken the whole thing in a carnal sense. And as for the powers and terrors of the unseen world, he knew nothing at all about them. And apparently he did not want to know about them, for he harked back to that which had attracted him at the first, and said to Christian, Tell me now further what the things are and how to be enjoyed whither we are going. These two men, as they went along, walking and talking, fell into the error of speaking a good deal about things which neither of them properly understood. It is true that Christian said, Since you are desirous to know, I'll read of them in my book. There was that good element in their conversation, which we can cordially commend. Still, even that they that may not be the wisest thing for young beginners to do, it is indeed a wise thing to read the Bible and to talk of what it contains, but this must be done with much prayer if it's to be of real spiritual benefit. I look in vain for any word about pliable praying, but I do read concerning Christian, even before he started on his pilgrimage, quote, he would also walk solitarily in the fields, sometimes reading, sometimes praying, and thus for some days he spent his time. Now I saw upon a time when he was walking in the fields that he was, as he was wont, reading in his book, and greatly distressed in his mind. And as he read, he burst out, as he had done before, crying, What shall I do to be saved? End of quote. He was not so with Bliable. What he heard Christian read from the book did not make him sorrowful, but enchanted and delighted him. He only thought of the celestial city, not of the plague of his own heart, nor of the damnable nature of his sin. These things had never come home with power to him as they had to Christian, and therefore he did not say, Come, let us kneel together and plead for mercy. But he said, Well, my good companion, glad am I to hear of these things. Come on, let's, let's mend our pace. Yes, at first there are None who are so enthusiastic as these empty, hollow ones. Let us mend our pace, said Pliable. Surely, brethren, the advice is good, but I do not like it from such lips. It is a very proper exhortation in its place, but not when it comes from one who has never been burdened on account of sin, nor broken under the hammer of God's law, nor made to feel his own nothingness and worthlessness. You who are empty may well travel quickly. You who never felt the load of sin upon your hearts may well run swiftly. Pliable is all for pushing on, making a stir, creating a noise. He attends revival services. He likes to have them protracted. And when the fit is on him, he would be willing to be up all night to turn his house out of the windows and to do all manner of extraordinary things all to show how full of zeal he is. But in a little time it will be all over. It's like the crackling of thorns under a pot. 
which burns so fiercely that they make the pot boil over and then put the fire out. Come, said Pliable, let's mend our pace, Christian said. And Christian said, I cannot go so fast as I would by reason of this burden that's on my back. And then, and just as they ended their talk, Bunyan tells us that they, quote, drew near to a very miry slough that was in the midst of the plain. And they, being heedless, did both fall suddenly into the bog. The name of the slough was Despond. With that, we move to chapter 2, The Two Pilgrims in the Slough. Through their much talking and little praying, and giving no heed to where they were going, Christian and Pliable all of a sudden found themselves floundering in the slough of despond. Bunyan says, Here, therefore, they wallowed for a time, being grievously bedaubed with dirt. And Christian, because of the burden that was on his back, began to sink in the mire. End of quote. Even then, had they but known where to look, they might have discovered that they were there by the direction of a lawgiver. Certain good and substantial steps, placed even through the very midst of this slough, had they set their feet upon these steps, in other words, had the pilgrims trusted the promises of God, they might have gone through to the other side with scarcely a stain upon their garments. I always feel inclined to blame evangelists for some of the discomfort that poor Christians suffered in the slough of despond. Oh, I'm a great lover of John Bunyan, but I do not believe him infallible. And the other day I, I met with a story about him, which I think a very good one. There was a, a young man in Edinburgh who wished to be a missionary. He was a wise young man, and so he thought, if I am to be a missionary, there's no need for me to transport myself far away from home. I may as well be a missionary in Edinburgh. Well, there's a hint to some of you ladies who give away tracts in your district and never give your servant Mary one. Well, anyway, this young man started and determined to speak to the first person he met. He met with one of those old fishwives. Those of us who have seen them can never forget them. They're extraordinary women indeed. So, stepping up to her, he said, Here you are, I'm coming along with your burden on your back. Let me ask you if you've got another burden, a, a spiritual burden. What? she asked. You mean that burden in, in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? Because if you do, young man, I got rid of that many years ago, probably before you were born. But I went a better way to work than the Pilgrim did. And the evangelist that John Bunyan talks about was one of your parsons that do not preach the gospel. For he said, keep that light in thine eye and run to the wicked gate. Why, man alive, that was not the place for him to run to. He should have said, do you see that cross? Run there at once. But instead of that, he sent the poor pilgrim to the wicked gate first. And much good he got by going there. But did you not, the young man asked, go through any slew of despond? Yes, I did, but I found it a great deal easier going through with my burden off than with it on my back. <laughs> well, the old woman was quite right. John Bunyan put the getting rid of the burden too far from the commencement of the pilgrimage. If he meant to show what usually happens, he was right. But if he meant to show what ought to have happened, he was wrong. We must not say to the sinner, Now, sinner... If thou wilt be saved, go to the baptismal pool, uh, go to the wicket gate, go to the church, do this or that. No, no. The cross should be right in front of the wicket gate. And we should say to the sinner, throw thyself down there, and thou art safe. But thou art not safe till thou canst cast off thy burden and lie at the foot of the cross and find peace in Jesus. Well, now, let us leave Christian for a little while. Turn our thoughts to his companion, Pliable. This experience in the slough of despond was the first trial he had met with since he had started on pilgrimage. It was, comparatively, a slight one. The slough was not likely to swallow them up. It was not nearly so bad as lying in giant despair's dungeon or fighting with Apollyon in the Valley of Humiliation. It was not much for anyone to endure, but it was more than pliable could stand. Punyon thus describes what happened to him. Quote, At this, Pliable began to be offended, and angrily said to his fellow, Is this the happiness you told me all this while of? 
If we have such ill speed at our first setting out, what may we expect betwixt this and our journey's end? And may I get out again with my life? You shall possess the brave country alone for me. And with that he gave a desperate struggle or two and got out of the mire on that side of the slough which was next to his own house. So away he went, and Christian saw him no more. End of quote. In like fashion, it often comes to pass that without any great outward trial, but simply through despondency of mind, a sudden damper pales the flush of early joy. Some of those who set out on the road to heaven turn back, and so prove that they did not start aright, and never had the work of God, the Holy Ghost, truly in their souls. Some of you, dear friends, when you are attending the services here, or meeting with your companions in one or other of our many Bible classes, you get very warm and excited and enthusiastic, and then perhaps you have to go away to live in the country, which is like going out of a hothouse into an ice well, and straightway you forget all about the happy experiences that you enjoyed amongst us. Or it may be that instead of your hearing a comforting and soothing sermon some Sunday morning, I preach an arousing, heart-searching one, and you're offended or frightened, and you give up all desire to tread the pilgrim pathway. The fearful soul that tires and faints and walks the ways of God no more is but esteemed almost a saint and makes his own destruction sure. Beware, I pray you, of any religion that merely springs from the carnal desire of enjoyment of heaven. Both the terrors of hell and the joys of heaven are insufficient to make the soul seek the Savior truly. There must be a sense of sin and a desire after holiness, because after all, the essence of hell is sin, and the essence of heaven is holiness, and you're not likely to go to God merely because of the external hell or heaven. You will only be led to trust in Jesus Christ through the essence of the two external things, namely, sin pressing upon you, and your soul crying out after purity and holiness and likeness to God. May God grant that we may not have any pliables in our church. Alas, we do get them sometimes, and they go a great deal further on the pilgrim's road than Mr. Bunyan describes. They go right by the interpreter's house. They climb up the hill difficulty. They even pass the cross, but of course, they never feel their burden roll off their backs. They are not conscious that there's a burden there. When Christians sing, they also sing because they think they are to have the same inheritance by and by. They generally go through the valley of humiliation in broad daylight. Apollyon never fights with them, and they wonder how it is that he does not assail them. They think what good people they are and what bad people they must be who have those stirrings and smitings of conscience of which they hear us speak. They cannot understand why we talk about Christians having such fierce conflicts within. But if they really knew the Lord, they would soon understand all about it. And until they do know him, much of our preaching must remain a mystery to them. Pliable was an utter stranger to vital godliness. He had converted himself, or rather Christian had converted him by his talk about heaven. And perhaps if it had not been for the slew of despond, he would have gone, as ignorance did, right to the riverside and been ferried over by vain hope only to be refused admission at the gate and to be carried by the two shining ones bound hand and foot and to be cast into hell by the back door. For there is a back door to hell as well as a front one. And some professors who have apparently gone very far on the road to heaven will ultimately go to hell by this door unless they repent of their sin and believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. But what became of Pliable after he struggled out of the slew of despond? Bunyan says, and I quote, Now, I saw in my dream that by this time Pliable was got home to his house again, so that his neighbors came to visit him. And some of them called him wise man for coming back. And some called him fool for hazarding himself with Christian. Others again did mock at his cowardliness, saying, Surely, since you began to venture, I would not have been so base as to have given out for a few difficulties. And so Pliable sat sneaking among them. End of quote. 
There is one thing about the world that I have often admired. We sometimes say, give the devil his due, and I, I will give the world its due. I mean that when a man goes a little way in religion and then turns back, mere worldlings generally despise him. I believe that the wicked world has a genuine respect for a true Christian. It hates him. That's the only homage it is able to pay him. The reason why the men of our Savior's day hated and mocked him was because they had what I may call an awful respect for him and did not know how otherwise to express it. They hated and loathed what they could not rightly appreciate, and thus they showed by their mockery and scorn how far they were from comprehending the excellence of the Savior. You must expect similar treatment from the ungodly if you are like your Lord. But when a pretended pilgrim turns back, they despise him. They call him a turncoat, and they could not very well hit upon a more correct name for him. Oh, they say, a little while ago you were with the earnest people, and you were apparently as earnest as they were, but what are you now? Then when the man is seen walking into the alehouse, uh, you know how they greet him. Ah, Mr. Sobersides, so you've come back, have you? And when they track him to the theater, they say to him, How long is it since you were at the tabernacle? or make some coarse joke about him. They know how to handle the whip of scorn, and I thank them for using it, and hope they will always lay on their blows right heavily. But mark you, the little scorn which Pliable finds it so hard to bear in this life is but a very slight foretaste of what he will have to bear in hell. You remember that remarkable description which is given by the prophet Isaiah of the king of Babylon, when he went down to hell, and all the kings whom he had destroyed and whose countries he had ravaged were lying on their beds of fire. And as they saw their great conqueror enter, instead of trembling, they hissed out, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? If any of you turn back, as Pliable did, this will be the worst element in your everlasting torment that you did, after a fashion, set out on the road to heaven, that you did pretend to be a Christian, that you said you had enlisted under the banner of the cross, that you talked a good deal about your experience, that you went to the prayer meeting and perhaps even prayed audibly, that you gave away tracts, and yet that you were, after all, only a hypocrite and therefore found yourself at the last amid the flames of hell. If I must perish, let it be as a sinner who has never professed to be a saint, rather than as a pliable who started for the celestial city and then returned to his home in the city of destruction. It would have been better for those who have had the taste of heavenly things in their mouth and yet have not tasted that the Lord is gracious if they had never known anything at all about the way of righteousness. Some of you, dear friends, must be either pliables or Christians. You have naturally such a disposition that you cannot help being easily influenced by your associates. And unless the grace of God shall make you a child of God, you'll be led astray from him. You cannot be obstinate. You're too good, as we use the word good in a common way. You're too kind, too affectionate and altogether too tender-hearted to act as that man did towards Christian. You could not bring yourself down to drink or swear. Your mother's influence and your father's example have too much power over you for you to become an obstinate. You cannot sin as others can. You cannot sin in ignorance. I was almost going to say, I wish you could. If you are to be lost, if you do not mean to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, if you are determined to perish, it were far better for you to perish as Tyre and Sidon than as Bethsaida or Chorazin or Capernaum. I believe that when some of you get into this tabernacle, you feel that you must be pliables. There are a few in this congregation whom I happen to know personally who cannot help coming to hear me, though they remain unsaved. I preach at them, and they know I do, and they respect me for it. 
and even thank me for it, and sometimes say that they hope they'll be converted one day, but they're so pliable that they will weep under a sermon and after a fashion pray, but when they get away from here, there's a stronger hand than mine that lays hold of them. Some companion says to them, come along. Never mind what Spurgeon says, come along with me, and they cannot say no. They have not the moral courage to say they will not go where the ungodly lead them. Whenever they are tempted to sin, they yield. They wish there were no tempters, and that they could get into a world where goodness was in the ascendant. They're like a sailing vessel, which depends on every wind, and is blown hither and thither by every breeze. They have no inward force to enable them to resist. This is not the way to get to heaven. You need, as it were, a divine engine mightily at work with all its heaving, panting energy that you may make headway against winds and waves and keep straight on at the same rate, always steadily advancing towards the far-off port. May God, by his grace, bring you to this blessed condition. I should have liked to have spoken to you so effectively that you could not have forgotten what I said, but would have gone home to think about it and to pray about it and to believe it. Uh, I should like you even to wish that you had never been born, because then I should hope that you would wish to be born again. There is no hope for you else. You have been born once. There is no possibility of your getting over the fact that you have your being. Ask the Lord that you may have your being in Christ Jesus. You are a creature. And the only hope for you is to be made a new creature in Christ Jesus. May the Holy Spirit bring you to this point. Ask him to do so. The best place to get a sense of sin is at the foot of the cross. May my blessed master meet you there and draw you to himself. And so may you be saved and not be found amongst the pliables at the last. Amen. We go to chapter 3. The man whose name was Help. Wherefore Christian was left to stumble in the slough of despond alone. But still he endeavored to struggle to that side of the slough that was still further from his own house and next to the wicket gate. The which he did, but he could not get out because of the burden that was upon his back. But I beheld in my dream that a man came to him whose name was Help and asked him what he did there. Christian says, Sir, I was bid go this way by a man called Evangelist, who directed me also to yonder gate, that I might escape the wrath to come, and as I was going thither, I fell in here. But why did you not look for the steps? Fear followed me so hard that I, I fled the next way and, and fell in. Then said he, Give me thy hand. So he gave him his hand, and he drew him out and set him upon sound ground, and bid him go on his way, according to Psalm 40, verse 2. End of quote. According to the diversity of gifts which proceeded from the self-same Spirit of God, those who labored in guiding wayfarers to the celestial city in the early ages of Christianity fulfilled different offices and were known by different names. Paul tells us in his first letter to the Corinthian pilgrims, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God hath set some in the church, first apostles. Now, these were to go from place to place, founding churches, ordaining ministers. And there were secondarily prophets, some of whom uttered prophecies, others were gifted in explaining them. Then came, thirdly, teachers, who were probably either pastors settled over diverse churches, guiding pilgrims along the heavenward road, as Greatheart did, or, or men like evangelists, journeying about to warn and direct such as they met. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, and the apostle does not forget to mention another class of persons, called helps. Who these people precisely were, it would be very difficult at this period of time, if not quite impossible, to tell. Some who are learned in the pilgrim records, have thought that they were assistant ministers who occasionally aided settled pastors, both in the pastoral work of visiting and also in preaching the word. Others have supposed that they were assistant deacons and perhaps even deaconesses, an office 
which was recognized in the apostolic churches. Others again have imagined these helps to have been the attendants in the sanctuary who took care that strangers were properly accommodated and managed those details in connection with the gatherings of persons for united worship, which always must be superintended by somebody. Whoever they were, or whatever may have been their functions, they appear to have been a useful body of people, worthy to be mentioned in the same list as apostles and prophets and teachers, and even to be named with miracle workers, those who had the gifts of healing. It is very probable that they had no official standing, but were only moved by the natural impulse of the divine life within them, to do anything and everything which would assist either teacher, pastor, or deacon in the work of the Lord. They were of that class of brethren who are useful anywhere, who can always stop a gap, who are only too glad when they find that they can make themselves serviceable to the church of God in any capacity, however lowly. The church in this age rejoices in a goodly brigade of helps, but perhaps a word or two may uh, stir up their pure minds by way of remembrance. John Bunyan, whom we shall see to be the master of Christian experience as well as of holy allegory, has in the passage at the head of this chapter described a part of the work of these helps which is most valuable and most required. The man whose name was Help came to Christian when he was floundering in the foul morass of despondency. Just when the poor man was likely to have been choked, having missed his footing in the slough, and when, with all his struggling, he was only sinking deeper and deeper into the mire, there suddenly came to him a person, of whom Bunyan says nothing more throughout his whole allegory, and here only tells us his name, who put out his hand, Speaking some words of encouragement to him, pulled him out of the mire, set him on the king's highway, and then went about his business. A man unknown to fame on earth, but enrolled in the annals of the skies as wise to win souls. There are periods in the divine life when the help of judicious Christian brethren is invaluable. Most of us, who are now rejoicing in a well-assured hope, have known quite as much as we wish to know about that awful slew of despond. I myself floundered in it for five years or thereabouts, and am therefore well acquainted with its terrible geography. In some places it is deeper than in others, and more nauseous, such as the spot where David was when he cried, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. But believe me, a man may reckon himself thrice happy when he gets out of it. For even at its best, when he is fairly in it, it threatens to swallow him up alive. Dear, very dear to us, must ever be the hand that helped us out of the horrible pit. And while we ascribe all the glory to the God of grace, we cannot but love most affectionately the instrument whom he sent to be the means of our deliverance. On the summit of some of the Swiss passes, the canton for the preservation and accommodation of travelers maintains a small body of men who live in a little house on the mountain and whose business it is to help travelers on their way. It was very pleasant when we were toiling up the steep ascent of the Col di Obia in uh, northern Italy to see some three or four miles from the top a man coming down who saluted us as though he had known us for years and had been waiting for our arrival. He carried a spade in his hand, and though we did not know what was ahead of us, he evidently knew all about it, and was forearmed and prepared for every emergency. By and by we came to deep snow, and our kind pioneer immediately went to work with his spade to clear a footway, along which he carried the weaker ones of the party upon his back. It was his business to care for travelers, and ere long he was joined by another, who brought with him refreshments for the weary ones. These men were helps, who spent their lives on that part of the road where it was known that their services would frequently be in requisition. They would have been worth little in the plains. Their attentions might even have been considered intrusive, and they met us in any other place. But they were exceedingly valuable, because they presented themselves just where they were required, having, as it were, waylaid us with kindness. 
Helps are of little use to a man when he can help himself. But when he is hopelessly slipping amid the slime of the slough of despond, then a man of affectionate heart becomes more precious than the gold of Ophir. The men of this brigade of helps, if I understand Bunyan aright, are stationed all around the borders of the great dismal swamp of despond, and it is their business to keep watch and listen along the brink of the slough for the cries of any poor benighted travelers who may be staggering in the mire. Just as the Royal Humane Society keeps its men along the borders of the lakes in the parks in winter time, and when the ice is forming, bids them to be on the watch and take care of any who may venture upon it, so a little knot of Christian people, both men and women, should always be ready in every church to listen for cries of distress and to watch for broken hearts and cast down spirits. Such are the helps whom we need, and such perhaps were the ancient helps mentioned by Paul. It may be well to give a few directions to these helps as to how they may assist seeking sinners out of the slew of despond. From my own pastoral experience, I am led to recommend a careful imitation of the man whose name was Help, as he is described by Bunyan. So first, when you meet with one who is despairing, get him to state his own case. When Help assisted Christian, he did not at once put out his hand to him, but he asked him what he did there and why he did not look for the steps. It does men much good to make them unveil their spiritual griefs to their comforters. Confession to a priest is an abomination, but the communication of our spiritual difficulties to a fellow Christian will often be a sweet relief and a helpful exercise. You who seek to aid the awakened will be wise, like the angels at the tomb, to inquire of the weeping Mary, woman, why weepest thou? Their answers will direct the helper's line of action and assist in the application of the necessary consolation. The patient who understands the malady will the more cheerfully yield to the treatment of a wise physician. I have occasionally found that the mere act of stating a difficulty has been the means of at once removing it. Some of the most distressing doubts, like hideous screech owls, will not bear the light of day. There are many spiritual difficulties which, if a man did but look them fully and fairly in the face long enough to be able to describe them, would vanish during the investigation. O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt, is our Lord's way of setting reason in battle array against unbelief. Let the mourner state his case by all means, and do you patiently listen to it. Get that young man alone, dear brother. Ask him to sit down quietly with you, and then inquire of him, What is the point that puzzles you? What cannot you understand? What is it that makes you so dejected and dispirited? Wisely did good help induce Christian to unbosom his griefs. Do thou likewise. Next to this, enter as much as lieth in you into the case before you. Help came to the brink of the slough and stooped down to his poor friend. This may seem to you perhaps an as unimportant direction, but depend upon it. You'll be able to give very little help, if any, if you do not follow it. Sympathy is the mainspring of our ability to comfort others. If you cannot enter into a soul's distress, you'll be no son of consolation to that soul. And so seek to bring yourselves down to weep with them that weep, that you may uplift them to the platform of your joy. Do not sneer at a difficulty because it seems small to you. Recollect that it may be very great to the person who is troubled by it. Do not begin to scold and tell the anxious inquirer that he ought not to feel as he does feel or to be distressed as he is. As God puts his everlasting arms underneath us when we are weak, so you must put the outstretched arms of your sympathy underneath your younger and weaker brethren that you may lift them up. If you see a brother in the mire, put your arms right down into the mud that, by the grace of God, you may lift him bodily out of it. Recollect that you were once just where that desponding sister of yours is now, and try, if you can, to bring back your own feelings uh, when you were in her condition. 
It may be, as you say, that the stripling or damsel is very foolish, yes, but you were yourself foolish once, and then you abhorred all manner of meat, and your soul drew near to the gates of death. You must, to use Paul's language, become a fool for their sake. You must put yourselves into the condition of these simple-minded ones. If you cannot do this, you need training to teach you how to be a help, as yet you do not know the way. Your next step may be to comfort these poor brethren with the promises of God. Help asked Christian why he did not look for the steps. For they were good and substantial stepping stones placed through the very midst of the slough. But Christian said he had missed them through excessive fear. We should point sinking souls to the many precious promises of God's word. Brethren, mind that you are yourselves well acquainted with the consoling declarations of Scripture. Have them on the tip of your tongue, ready for use at any time that they are required. I've heard of a certain scholar who used to carry miniature copies of the classic authors about with him, so that he seemed to have almost a, a Bodleian library in his pocket. Oh, that you would carry miniature Bibles about with you, or better still, that you had the whole word of God hidden in your hearts so that like your Lord, you should know how to speak a word in season. And uh, to him that is weary, a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Whenever you come across a distressed soul, what a blessed thing it is for you to be able to say to him, yes, you, you are a sinner, it is true, but Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Possibly he will tell you that he cannot do anything. But you may answer that he is not told to do anything. For it is written, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He will perhaps reply that he cannot believe. But you can remind him of the promise, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Some texts in the Bible are like those constellations in the heavens, which are so conspicuous that when the mariner once sees them, he knows in what direction he is steering. Certain brilliant passages of Scripture appear to be set in the firmament of Revelation as guiding stars to bewildered souls. Point to these. Quote them often. Rivet the sinner's eyes upon them. Thus shall you aid him most efficiently. If a despairing soul should read these pages, let me quote to him these exceeding great and precious promises of our gracious Lord. Quote, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. End of quote. These three texts are specimens of the steps which the Lord of the way has caused to be placed where they can best assist sinking sinners. After quoting the promises, try to instruct those who may need your help more fully in the plan of salvation. The gospel is preached every Sabbath day in thousands of pulpits, yet there is nothing that is so little known or rightly understood as the truth as it is in Jesus. The preacher cannot, even with all his attempts, make the simple gospel plain to some of his hearers. But you, who are no preachers, may be able to do it, because your state of mind and education may happen just to suit the comprehension of the person concerned. God is my witness how earnestly I always endeavor to make clear and plain whatever I say, but yet my peculiar modes of thought and expression may not be suitable to the cases of certain persons in my audiences. You, by holy tact and perseverance, may be able to cheer those hearts, which gather not a gleam of light from me. If my brethren and sisters, the helps, will be constantly and intelligently active, they may, by homely language, often explain where theologians only confuse. That which may not have been understood in the form of scholastic divinity may reach the heart when uttered in the language of daily life. We need parlor and kitchen and workshop preachers who can talk the natural speech of men. Universities and colleges often obscure the truth by their modes of speech. If you, our friends who mingle with the world, will only put the same thing in another shape, the sinner will say, Ah, I see it now. 
I could not comprehend it from the pastor's language, but I can understand it from your plain talk. Do, if you would help souls, point them to the Savior. Do not trouble them with irrelevant matters. Direct them at once to the precious blood of Jesus, for that is the one source of pardon and cleansing. Tell the sinner that whosoever trusts in Jesus shall be saved. Do not point to the wicked gate as evangelists did, for that is not the truest way, but bid the sinner go straightway to the cross. Poor Christian need not have wallowed in the slough of despond if he had met with a fully instructed believer to direct him at the first. Do not scold the mistaken evangelist, but seek by always pointing the sinner to Calvary to undo the mischief he wrought to the pilgrim. Would you supplement this? Then tell the troubled one your own experience. Many have been aided to escape from the slough of despond in this way. What? exclaims the young friend to whom we are speaking. Did you ever feel as I do? I have often been amused, and when I have been talking with inquirers, to see them open their eyes with amazement, to think that I had ever felt as they did, whereas I should have opened mine with far greater astonishment if I had not. We tell our patients all their symptoms, and then they think we must have read their hearts, while the fact is that our hearts are just like theirs. And in reading ourselves, we read them. We've gone along the same road as they have. And it would be a very hard thing if we could not describe what we have ourselves undergone. Even advanced Christians often derive great comfort from reading and hearing the experience of others, if it is anything like their own. And to young people, it is a most blessed means of grace to hear others tell what they have gone through before them. I wish our elder brethren would be more frequently helps in this matter, and that when they see others in trouble, they would tell them that they have passed through the very same difficulties, instead, as some do, of blaming the young people for not knowing what they cannot know, and upbraiding them because they have not old heads on young shoulders, where, by the way, they would be singularly out of place. <laughs> Once more, you'll very much help the young inquirer by praying with him. Oh, the power of prayer. When you cannot tell the sinner what you want to say, you can sometimes tell it to God in the sinner's hearing. There's a way of saying in prayer with a person what you cannot say direct to his face. And it is well sometimes when praying with another to put the case very plainly and earnestly, something in this way. Lord, thou knowest that this poor woman now kneeling before thee is very much troubled, but it is her own fault. She will not believe in thy love because she says she feels no evidence of it. Thou hast given evidence enough in the gift of thy dear son, but she will persist in wanting to see something of her own upon which she may rest, some good frames or feelings. She has been told many times that all her hope lies in Christ and not at all in herself. Yet she will continue to seek fire in the midst of water and life in the graves of death. Open her eyes, Lord. Turn her face in the right direction. Lead her to look to Christ and not to self. Praying in this way puts the case very plainly and may be in itself useful. Moreover, there is a real power in prayer. The Lord assuredly hears the cries of his people still. As certainly as the electric fluid bears the message from one place to another, as certainly as the laws of gravitation control the sphere, so certainly is prayer a mysterious but a very real power. God does answer prayer. We are as sure of this as we are that we breathe. We have tried it and proved it. It is not occasionally that God has heard us, but it has become as regular a thing with us to ask and have as it is for our children to ask us for food and to receive it at our hands. I should hardly think of attempting to prove that God hears my prayer. I have no more doubt about it than I have of the fact that the law of gravitation affects me in walking and sitting still and rising up and in lying down. Exercise then this power of prayer, and you shall often find that when nothing else will help a soul out of its difficulty, supplication will do it. There are no limits, dear friends, if God be with you, to your ability to help others through the power of prayer. These directions, and they are not very many, you should keep in your memories, as you would the directions of the Royal Humane Society with reference to people 
who have been in danger of drowning. We now move to the next chapter, chapter 4, also called Helps. Having spoken about the best way of helping souls out of despondency and distress, I shall now proceed to describe those who may truly be called helps. For it is not everybody, and not even every professing Christian, who is qualified to perform this most needful work. Now, the first essential for a true help is that he should have a tender heart. Some brethren are, by divine grace, specially prepared and fitted to become soul winners. I know an earnest brother, whom I have often called my hunting dog, for he is always on the watch for those who have been wounded by the word. No sooner does he see that there are souls that appear to be anxious than he is on the alert. And whenever he hears of a meeting of converts, he's all astir. He may have appeared dull and heavy before, but at such times his eyes flash, his heart beats more quickly, his whole soul is moved to action. He becomes like a new man. In other company, he might not feel at home, but among converts and inquirers, he is all alive and happy. Where they are to be found, his heart takes fire directly. For amidst the diversities of gifts that proceed from the one spirit, his gift evidently is that of helping souls out of spiritual trouble. Such a man was Timothy, of whom Paul wrote to the Philippians, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. You know that in ordinary life, some people are born nurses while others cannot nurse at all. If you were ill, you would not care to have them near you, even if they would come for nothing or pay you for having them. Probably they mean well, but somehow or other they have not the gentleness and tenderness which are essential in a good nurse. They stamp across the room so heavily that they wake up their poor patient. And if there be any medicine to be taken at night, it tastes all the worse if they administer it to you. But on the other hand, you have known a real nurse, perhaps your own wife. You never heard her walk across the room when you were ill for she stepped so softly that you might almost as soon hear her heartbeat as hear her footfall. And then, too, she understands your taste, your likes and dislikes, and always knows exactly what to bring you to tempt your feeble appetite. Whoever heard of a nurse more fit for her work than Miss Nightingale? She seems as if God had sent her into the world on purpose, not only that she might be herself a nurse, but that she might teach others to nurse. It is even thus in spiritual things. I have used a homely illustration to show you what I mean. There are some people who, if they try to comfort the distressed, go to work so awkwardly that they're pretty sure to cause a great deal more trouble than they removed. And to console the mourner is evidently not their forte. The true help to souls in trouble is one who, though his head may not be filled with classic lore, has a large and warm heart. He is, in fact, all heart. It was said of the beloved Apostle John that he was a pillar of fire from head to foot. This is the kind of man that a soul wants when it is shivering in the cold winter of despondency and distress. We know some such men. May God train many more and give to all of us more of the gentleness that was in Christ. For unless we are in this way fitted for the work, we shall never be able to do it properly. A true help wants not only a large and loving heart, but a very quick eye and ear. There is a way of getting the eye and ear sensitively acute with regard to sinners. I know some brethren and sisters who, when they are sitting in their pews, can almost tell how the word is operating upon those who are near them. Trained and experienced help knows just what they ought to say to their neighbors when the sermon is over. They understand how to say it and whether they ought to say it in the pew or, or going down the stairs or outside the building or whether they ought to wait till later in the week, they have a kind of sacred instinct or rather an unction from the Holy Spirit which tells them just what to do, how to do it and when to do it. It is a blessed thing when God thus sets his watchmen along the borders of the slew of despond. Then with quick ears they listen. They listen to every sound and by and by... When they hear a splash in any part of the mire, though it may be very dark and misty, they hasten to the rescue. Possibly nobody else hears the cry of the soul in distress but those who lay themselves out to listen for it. 
Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.